When a tornado siren sounds, you're lucky to have half an hour to take shelter. But a tornado can form and dissipate within seconds, and that's a very difficult forecasting challenge. For some, the first warning is the sight of a giant gray vortex of extreme wind twisting violently across the horizon. Oh my God. And then catastrophe. Homes reduced to rubble, cars tossed like tin toys, families torn apart. Not many things are designed to withstand 200 mile an hour wind. Scientists are still chasing answers to what causes the fastest winds on the face of the Earth. We're trying to understand why some tornadoes become very intense and become the real killer F4 and F5 tornadoes that we're most concerned about. We actually don't know some of the last processes that really make a storm form a tornado. Unraveling the tracks of killer tornadoes may help us one day understand exactly when and where the next big outbreak will strike. Around the world, humanity exists only moments from catastrophe. Disaster bubbles below the surface of the Earth, strikes from the heavens, or engulfs us from the sea. But we are not merely at the mercy of our planet. In our pursuit of industry, global connectivity, and reach for the stars, lives have been lost. Disasters reveal the best and worst of mankind as one tragedy compounds another. How do these disasters occur? And what lessons can equip us when catastrophe strikes again? The United States of America is a hotbed for tornadoes. More strike here than any other country on Earth. But the spring of 2011 brought devastation to numerous states in the biggest and most destructive outbreak in US history. In an extraordinary four-day stretch in April, 360 tornadoes ripped through multiple states killing hundreds and racking up a $12 billion bill. Oh, he's over, he's over. Go, go, go. It was the second catastrophic outbreak that month. The first began as a strong low pressure system traveled across the central plains of the US, pulling up warm, moist air from the Gulf of Mexico. As it interacted with a mass of cool, dry air blowing through from Canada, a line of supercell thunderstorms began to form, setting the scene for explosive, severe weather. A supercell thunderstorm is a very strong and persistent thunderstorm. They can last for hours. The key ingredient is that they are rotating and tilted. These tilted, rotating thunderstorms we see in the High Plains in Tornado Alley can last for hours and hours and sometimes produce multiple and violent tornadoes. You need the air to be very unstable, and that means the air wants to rise violently. There's air that's very low density at the surface, and there's air that's very high density above. The atmosphere wants to flip, wants to go up violently and change. You also need very strong winds. If cool, descending dry air passes over rising, warm, moist air, it's the perfect setup for a flip. This happens in a normal thunderstorm, which can quickly kill itself off. What will happen is that the rain will fall back down and kill off the original updraft, and you'll have a basically a life cycle of a, of a normal, what they call an air mass thunderstorm. To brew up a supercell, you need an added ingredient of strong, multi-directional winds at different altitudes. And then the real key ingredient is something that we call wind shear. So it's winds in the atmosphere that change speed with height, and they also change direction with height. Basically what it does is it creates rotation, but this rotation is horizontal. As you know, a tornado is vertical. So what ends up happening is this horizontal rotation, these supercells have very big, strong updrafts. Basically, it gets tilted into the vertical, so then you get 
the supercell, so you get this rotating thunderstorm. And that rotation acts to uh, bring the rain to off to the side of the updraft and allows the supercell to exist as an entity uh, much, much longer than an ordinary air mass thunderstorm. Are you declaring an emergency, sir? Watch all episodes of Ice Pilots. <laughs> Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Bailey now. Instead of cooling itself off, a rotating supercell just keeps on going. And those are usually the strongest thunderstorms and they're associated with the most severe weather. So winds, hail, and then tornadoes. And usually the strongest tornadoes come from these supercell thunderstorms. Large tornado crossing the highway just in front of us. And then it becomes a tricky part of how the tornado actually forms. So there's downdrafts and updrafts associated with this rotating part of the supercell. As this downdraft is coming down, it's bringing down rotation to the surface. But only a small fraction of supercells produce tornadoes, which is another forecasting challenge. On the 14th of April, the old river town of Poplar Bluff in Missouri copped a severe hailstorm. It followed a four-day deluge that drenched the region with 15 inches of rain and broke the banks of the Black River. And then came the tornadoes, one after another. These outbreaks tend to be a number of supercells that are spawning one after another after another tornado. That's why they're so destructive, because it's not like one and done. The tornado may dissipate, but then it's usually followed by another tornado. Over the next three days, more than 150 tornadoes rampaged from Oklahoma to the Carolinas in an extraordinary severe weather blitz that killed at least 38 people, becoming the most active outbreak on record. In North Carolina, 30 tornadoes caused 22 fatalities, a state record. Days later, in a terrifying start to Easter, two large supercell thunderstorms moved into St. Louis, Missouri, sparking five tornadoes. The worst, a large E-4, barreled through the terminals at Missouri's International Airport. Three planes were on the tarmac, full of passengers, who rode out the most severe turbulence imaginable while still firmly on the ground. Outside the terminal, the extreme wind tossed vehicles about, including one van that was nearly pushed off the edge of an upper-level car park. A large section of the roof was torn off. Many of the glass doors and panes shattered. While many travel plans were shredded by the event, the biggest miracle of the Good Friday tornado was that no one was seriously hurt. A few days later, the super outbreak began to brew. A gigantic long wave trough came in from the west, sending alarm bells ringing throughout the central plains. Weather forecasts look set for hell to unleash across multiple states. The Storm Prediction Center issued a particularly dangerous situation tornado watch for Arkansas, Missouri, Texas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana part of the famed Tornado Alley. The United States is really a great place for tornadoes because a lot of the key ingredients come together. And in particular, they come together a lot of times in the early spring in, in the central part of the United States, what's commonly known as Tornado Alley. Much of the landscape is flat plains, as far as the eye can see. Lying between two mountain ranges, the Rockies and the Appalachian. It is just a hot spot where there's typically a lot of instability. There's a lot of wind shear, and it just is a prime area for very, very severe thunderstorms. 
because we have the Gulf of Mexico, which has an enormous amount of warm, moist air that comes out from the south into the plains, but also the Rocky Mountains, which helps produce very cool, dry air that comes in aloft, it sets itself up for overturning. And that overturning, when the warm, moist air goes violently upwards, that's how you form a thunderstorm. But uniquely in North America, there's an overlap between where that warm, moist air is flowing north from the Gulf of Mexico and waves that are still left over from late winter and early spring in the jet stream. Jet streams are ribbons of wind that circle the globe at high altitudes. As they surge over the Rockies heading east, waves in the wind belt help deliver a good dose of spin and speed to the cool, dry air. This provides the wind shear and rotation needed for supercell thunderstorms. If those ingredients all occur, then the Storm Prediction Center, which does forecast for tornadoes, will issue sort of an outlook that says, this area looks prime for tornadoes. On the evening of the 25th, the first tornado to cause multiple deaths hit Valonia in Faulkner County, Arkansas. It was an EF2 wedge tornado. Wedge tornadoes get their name because they're so fat and wide, they sometimes look like a block of black clouds jammed into the ground. And they always say it sounds like a train. It didn't, it just was a you know, loud wind, our ears popped and then just in the seconds it was over. Valonia is little more than a street in the center of farmland. The storm churned through the center of it, flattening mobile homes, flipping trailers and downing trees. We need boots on the ground. We need, we need people here with hands on, moving stuff, piling stuff. Four people were killed. A toll which could have been much worse had the town not received a 30-minute warning. I think we're pretty good at trying to forecast supercells or tornadic thunderstorms. The difficulty is if that thunderstorm will produce a tornado and when will it produce a tornado. If you ask me what's that fraction, about 20 to 25 percent of all rotating thunderstorms produce tornadoes. There is no long-range forecasting of tornadoes, only the conditions that make them likely to happen. The average lead time during the April outbreaks was about 25 minutes. But then we have what we call the Storm Prediction Center. The SPC is looking at the weather everywhere, basically really only looking at the severe weather threat. So we're taking observations all the time in our atmosphere, and these are being fed into computer models. So we're watching these systems come across, looking for key ingredients that make up supercells, because supercells are what's going to make the strongest tornadoes. Aspects of tornado formation remain a mystery, and the science of forecasting is relatively young. But a tornado can form and dissipate within seconds, within minutes, and, and that's a, just a very difficult forecasting challenge. Because they are so short-lived and unpredictable, getting clear images has historically been part of the problem. The 1957 Dallas tornado was a turning point in tornado research. As it churned a deadly 25 kilometer path through a metropolitan area, it was clearly visible for around 40 minutes it became one of the best documented tornadoes. More than 100 people caught it on film. From these clips and other photographs, scientists were able to estimate wind velocities and the speed of the tornado. Engineers were also able to relate those speeds to damages on the ground. In that storm, 500 were made homeless, 200 injured, and 10 people perished. Most of the reports of tornadoes came from unscientific observation. They'd go out and interview the farmer, what happened here? And the farmer would say something like, well, we lost the roof in this house, and uh, for some reason here, my chicken was completely plucked after the uh, tornado went through. And then have to figure out, well, you know, what is, uh, what is the wind that it would take to pluck a chicken? Those kind of things, right? 
By the early 60s, the interstate highway system had been completed in the U.S., and so it became possible to navigate your way to, to a thunderstorm and start making scientific observations. One of the researchers there, a guy named Neil Ward, was the first person to, to get the idea to get in his car and chase after a thunderstorm. What he found is the, that there was a very characteristic set of events in these thunderstorms that precede the tornado formation. For example, they find that there is a cloud base, and before the tornado forms, there's a lowering of the cloud base called a wall cloud. Then there's a rain shaft that is basically on the backside of the wall cloud. So there were just a number of uh, scientific observations. The study of tornadoes took a huge leap in the 70s when a team of scientists first managed to intercept a tornado with an experimental Doppler radar. On May 24th, 1973, conditions in Oklahoma were lining up for tornado formation and an array of instruments and cameras were set up in the field, ready for the chance. There was a severe tornado a case, and, and it actually led to the development or formation of the National Severe Storms Lab. They chose a good location. Right on cue, an F4 tornado ripped through the farming town of Union City. And for the first time, scientists were able to capture its entire life cycle with radar from start to finish. It changed tornado forecasting forever. The National Severe Storms Laboratory is a national laboratory funded by NOAA, uh, which also funds the National Weather Service, the Storm Prediction Center, the Hurricane Center, all these groups that are associated with forecasting weather. But the Severe Storms Laboratory focuses on research, which can be very quickly applied to making better forecasts of tornadoes and other severe storms, including hailstorms and flash floods and other phenomena. Doppler radar scans of the Union City tornado led to two critical discoveries. That rotating thunderstorms could lead to tornado formation and that a tornado vortex signature, a strong radar indication of circulation, often appeared about 25 minutes before the tornado. Here, they had two critical potential warning devices, which could save many lives. Just one year after the Union City tornado, the super outbreak of 1974 occurred. It remains the deadliest spate of US tornadoes on record. As the National Weather Services were still using 1950s equipment for forecasting, warnings were virtually non-existent. It was a particularly violent outbreak, carrying with it 30 EF4 and EF-5 tornadoes. 335 people were killed and 6,000 injured. It sounded like a big train whistle when we were right underneath the front of it. I've, I've never seen anything like it and I don't want to again. Although a horrendous toll, the 1974 outbreak brought critical changes that saved lives in the future. I don't know. It was just terrible. Most importantly, money for tornado intercept research increased. What can you do? We've lost everything that we had. Secondly, they brought in the Fujita scale as a standard language for scientists to discuss and reference different strength tornadoes. There's something we use called the Enhanced Fujita Scale. Really what it is, is it's um, a damage-based scale, so looking at damage, wind speeds are inferred. Tornadoes are rated 
by the amount of damage they do. So if tornadoes break a few branches, they're F0 or F1. If they completely wipe houses down to their foundation, so there's nothing left but the slab, that's an F5. In between, there are different levels of damage from lifting off a roof, maybe that's F1, to removing a bunch of walls, that might be F2. There are a lot finer details than that, but roughly it's the level of destruction that a home or other structure experiences. If a tornado has ferocious winds, but lands in a rural area with no destruction of property, they will receive a low rating, even those that normally cause the total obliteration of well-built structures. So if a strong tornado with 400 kilometer per hour winds goes through open wind fields, it's rated F0. In some sense, that's kind of silly because we know it's much stronger than that. Even if we measure winds stronger than that with a radar, it's officially rated F0 because of the damage. We are working with the American Society of Civil Engineers to develop a standard that uses all available evidence, including damage, radar measurements, anemometers, to try to come up with the most comprehensive and most accurate measurement of tornado winds. Get in the base. Although only around 1% of tornadoes in the US are classified on the top end of the scale, an EF4 or EF5, the majority of deaths are in these two classes. Any tornado that has a greater chance of hitting an urban area is likely to be higher rated, do more damage, and kill more people. With the advent of the Doppler radar, it's become possible for researchers to measure the extreme speeds of tornado vortexes. Doppler radar uses microwave beams to sweep through storms. These microwaves can be reflected off particles such as rain, hail, and other debris. The radar uses the Doppler effect to work out which direction and how fast these particles are traveling by how they change the reflected signal. If the object is moving away from the antenna, a lower frequency signal is detected. Higher if the object is moving towards the antenna. A computer translates the information into a visual representation, where different frequencies are viewed as different colors, representing speed and direction. I lead the Center for Severe Weather Research, which operates the Doppler on Wheels mobile radar fleet and also other instruments that we drop in front of tornadoes, hurricanes, other kinds of interesting weather. We've compressed everything and made it rugged and mobile so we can chase to the weather. We can go to tornadoes instead of waiting for them to come to us. By getting up close, we can see the, the fingerprints, the small details that you just can't see from farther away. We're trying to understand the map of the winds inside tornadoes. Where are the strongest winds? How are they doing damage? We're trying to watch the birth process of tornadoes and understand why some thunderstorms produce tornadoes and some don't. We're trying to understand why some tornadoes become very intense and become the real killer F4 and F5 tornadoes that we're most concerned about. Using radar, wind speeds of incredibly destructive strengths can be measured. We try to get really close, and what we could do is we can map out the two and three dimensional structure with the radar. And the closer you get, the lower down you can look inside the tornado, and the closer you get to the surface, those are the winds that are actually really impacting buildings and structures and people. Perhaps the strongest winds produced on the face of the Earth is associated with tornadoes. Recent studies using mobile Doppler radars have documented unambiguous winds of around 135 to 140 meters per second, almost 300 miles an hour winds. It's an amazing number. The fascinating thing is the tornado, how can it produce such a strong wind locally compacted at the base of the funnel of a tornado? There's a very good radar network across the US now. You can uh, see actually see uh, rotation in, in the storm, which is also an indicator of tornado genesis. Rotation in a storm can be seen as a characteristic hook. The tornado itself 
as a coupling of green and red intense bands. Doppler radar can also help forecasters identify tornado signatures, like debris vaults, which are areas of high reflectivity, where debris is carried aloft in the tornado. Particularly strong tornadoes can have massive debris balls, like the EF5 Bridge Creek tornado. One of the strongest tornadoes we've ever observed was in central Oklahoma, near Bridge Creek and Moore in 1999. That tornado went directly through a metropolitan area, so it had very high impact, killed almost 40 people, destroyed thousands of homes, just this one tornado. And we measured the strongest winds we've ever seen, or I think anybody has ever seen, over 300 miles an hour, almost 500 kilometers per hour. The damage in that tornado was not just F5, it was very, you know, serious F5 level damage. Homes were just wiped and scoured off their foundations. Fields and lawns were, were scoured with the grass removed. It was a very dramatically strong tornado that caused bad impacts, you know, strong impacts to the areas it hit. I walked into the tree line, caught a movement out the corner of my eye under some debris around the base of a tree. I seen a, what appeared to be a baby. Oklahoma City is near the heart of Tornado Alley in the US, and Moore has had its fair share. Being struck more than 20 times by tornadoes, a number of them particularly violent and destructive. On the afternoon of May 20th, 2013, another long-lived EF5 tornado mowed through the town. Whole neighborhoods looked as though they'd been thrown in a blender so unrecognizable that street signs had to be urgently printed so that rescuers could map out where they were. In the direct path of the tornado lay two elementary schools. Parents arrived to pick up their children from school, only to discover in horror that virtually nothing was left of the buildings. Miraculously, no one died at Briarwood Elementary, but seven children perished at Plaza Towers. Neither of the schools had shelters. After the devastation, there was an outcry for change. School districts across the state called for greater funding to afford every at-risk school a tornado shelter. EF5 tornadoes are extremely rare, but the super outbreak of 2011 had three and 12 EF4s, which helps explain why such widespread destruction occurred. Most of the violent tornadoes struck on one awful day, April 27, with more than 300 deaths occurring in the space of 24 hours. Alabama bore the brunt of it. The 2011 outbreak was largely in the southeast. Uh, Tuscaloosa and Birmingham were particularly hard hit. In Tuscaloosa and Birmingham, the first wave brought nearly three dozen twisters that morning knocking out communications and power. Few expected a second round of supercells were about to whip up the most violent and long-lived tornadoes. That afternoon, an incredibly wide EF4, which spanned more than 26 football fields, churned across 130 kilometers of landscape. Wind speeds were greater than 300 kilometers an hour. 65 people were killed in that single event. The cost of simply removing the extensive debris from Tuscaloosa was estimated at $100 million. I'm grateful that we, we survived it, but it was one of the most horrifying experiences I think I've ever experienced in my life. Sometimes that surprises people because people say, well, that's not Tornado Alley. Tornado Alley is Texas, Oklahoma, 
Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa sort of area. Uh, but actually down in the southeast, they can get pretty severe tornadoes too. Alabama lies in the tornado-prone Dixie Alley, a loosely defined southeastern region. Although it gets less tornadoes than the better known Tornado Alley, generally, they are longer lived. Dixie Alley is the deadliest region for tornadoes, but this is not based on wind speeds alone. Dixie Alley bucks the seasonal trends for tornadoes. They can even occur in winter. Many also happen at night. This leaves people less ready to respond to a warning, more likely to be taken by surprise. I knew I was in deep trouble when I saw the building coming apart across the highway here. And the next thing I knew, I was rolling. Half of the nation's mobile homes are located in the southeast. I had lived in the trailer east of you. Uh, unfortunately, I was lucky, just twisted the top off of mine. According to the Storm Prediction Center, most tornado deaths happen in mobile homes. But unfortunately, my brother wasn't so lucky. The tornado hit it and tore it all to pieces. Which are far less structurally sound than a well-built house. Dixie Alley also has a different landscape. Much of it is covered in trees, is hilly and humid. Clouds hang lower, and tornadoes can be harder to see. Because Dixie Alley is closer to the Gulf, it also increases the likelihood of violent, rain-wrapped tornadoes. Rain wraps tornadoes is literally where there's a curtain of rain that just sort of wraps around the tornado, so it's a, it's a good descriptive term. Uh, the danger with that is it often hides the tornado visually. So if you're not fortunate enough to have a radar with you, for example, you may not even see the tornado and, and not realize it's right behind this curtain of rain. How big a tornado actually is seems to be as much a matter of opinion as it is science. Defining tornado size is problematic because everyone has their own definition. People who are out chasing look at the condensation funnel and say, that's how wide the tornado is. Worse, they're just looking at it and estimating and saying, that looks two miles wide. It's very crude, just eyewitness reports of what they think they're seeing. The Weather Service rates tornadoes by how wide a swath of damage they make. My team rates tornadoes by how big the wind circulation is, because we're making detailed maps of what the winds are. Still, some tornadoes are much, much wider than others. The widest tornado that we've ever documented, and we're in agreement with other methods of documenting width of tornadoes, was back in 2013 in central Oklahoma, near a town called El Reno. And that tornado had a width of damaging winds that we mapped that at times was four or five kilometers wide. It was extremely broad. But this was a very complex tornado. It didn't just have a single swirl of wind. Inside that were these other most violent features of the tornado that were spinning around it. Like many multi-vortex tornadoes, the El Reno Twister proved to be highly unpredictable dangerous and difficult to navigate. The tornado essentially breaks down into multiple funnels all rotating around a common core. That actually happens fairly commonly with all tornadoes. Perhaps the unique aspect of the El Reno tornado is because the tornado itself was very large. These multiple funnels or suction vortices were also very large. It was one of the largest funnels ever. It was we believe an EF5 tornado, but it actually was rated EF3. There was some controversy about that. Although El Reno was only initially rated an EF3 because of the damage, individual vortices were some of the strongest ever recorded. The highest measurement of 475 kilometers an hour was the second fastest wind speed measured, just below the Bridge Creek tornado. The twister killed 20 people including a team of researchers attempting to document the tornado. One of the most famous and deadly multi-vortex tornadoes descended on the western edge of the city of Joplin, Missouri, on May 22, 2011. 
The Joppa Tornado is well known because it went right through a medium-sized, small city. Back up. Yeah. Oh, no. And it turns out to be the seventh deadliest tornado in history. Why that's remarkable is the other tornadoes that were in that same ranking occurred many, many years, decades ago. So you would think with all the new technology, with all the new computers, with all the new satellite technology, how did we have an event that ranks number seven on the fatality list of tornadoes? The EF-5 touched down at 5.41 p.m. on a Sunday evening, and weather services knew in advance it was coming. Why so many people died? Turns out it wasn't because the forecast was bad, because that might be one of the first guesses. Well, the forecast must have been terrible. They had no warning. They had actually quite a bit of warning. It turns out that a large part of this was the, the social response from the people. They went back and checked, and a lot of the people that heard the alarm go off waited to hear another confirmation. Somebody calling them to confirm that you better get out of the way, or watching on TV to see maybe a TV weather forecaster to come on. That delay of waiting for a second confirmation was not good. People needed to move, and they needed to move very quickly. Joplin residents had almost half an hour to take shelter, but many didn't heed the warnings because they'd become desensitized to sirens. There's always a worry that you're crying wolf too much. Hello? That's been one of the hardest Hello? things to sort of reduce the false alarm rates. Oh, give her, sweetie. Give her, honey. Give her, sweetie. It's okay. It's not just hard science research. There's a social science aspect of how people react to warnings. And with the Joplin case, that couldn't be better illustrated. And that is what led to so many people dying. They simply didn't get out of the way when they were warned well ahead of time. It hit a substantial part of the town, so residential places, commercial places, and then also the Joplin Hospital um, was also impacted by that tornado. Views of the damage from the air give an idea of just how big and destructive the multi-vortex tornado was. Entire neighborhoods were blown away. What we say about suction vortices is that if you've looked at aerial damage photos, oftentimes you sort of see marks like this along a tornado track. So I often call them spirograph marks because that's literally what it is. And that's where the biggest or the strongest damage tends to occur. In 40 terrifying minutes, it devoured more than 7,000 homes, nearly 500 businesses, and claimed 161 lives. I had done an analysis several years before asking what if? What if a Joplin-like tornado, what if a strong tornado like we had seen in Bridge Creek or even El Reno went through St. Louis or went through Chicago or went through Atlanta? And the what if consequences were huge, you could damage 50, 100,000 different homes, potentially you could kill 1,000 people if you went through the suburbs of one of these large cities. That was very hypothetical until we had seen Joplin. If the Joplin tornado had occurred just 50 miles from its, where it went through Joplin, if it had gone through suburban St. Louis, you could have had outcomes much worse than that. And that was very sobering for those of us who were looking at these worst case kind of what if scenarios. Some scientists actually questioned whether the F5 was a high enough rating on the Fujita scale or whether we actually needed a higher rating on that scale was to put into context how big that, that tornado really was. And the, the Joplin tornado was especially devastating in that it destroyed approximately one third of the physical landscape. Joplin is characterized as a near-miss event because it actually occurred on a Sunday. Had the Joplin tornado occurred on a school day, school administrators there after that terrible storm acknowledged that many school children likely would have perished in the Joplin schools that were so badly devastated in that tornado event. The giant tornado caused damage to around three quarters of Joplin's buildings. The following day, Missouri Task Force One was sent in to start clearing up the damage and searching for missing persons. I hope you do 
find somebody. Find information. Write it in a marker on their head. If they do not have a head or a proper place to write, write it on their torso. I don't want to see any information on their limbs. Okay. Don't worry about desecrating somebody's loved one. You're not. You're giving us information so we can get the loved one to them. They'll clean them up before they see them. Okay? Dog teams scoured piles of rubble to try to establish where people lay buried. Everything's gone. Nothing's ever gonna be the same again. Nothing's ever gonna be the same again. <laughs> Even as scores of volunteers arrived to help clean up the disaster, the city remained in a state of high alert as storms gathered on the horizon once more and begun to pummel the city. Although they can bring the highest wind speeds known to man, the chances of surviving a severe tornado are high if the warnings are heeded. When there is a warning, that means a tornado either is coming towards their area or might come towards their area very soon. And they should take action. They should take reasonable action to either get to an interior room of their house, or if there's a community shelter, if they're living in manufactured homes, get to one of those community shelters that's stronger. They should, as much as possible, really try to stay calm and organized. It's when people panic, people start to make poor decisions. They either try to run away or they don't pay attention and they watch it. They get mesmerized and stare at it. Or they go into a ditch where it might flood. You know, a lot of people drive towards it because they want to get a better look. The sensible thing to do is try to get away. You know, not many things are designed to withstand a you know, 200 mile an hour wind. If you have a hole on the ground to crawl into, you should do that. Quick thinking may have saved many children during a deadly tornado outbreak in Indiana, March 2012. At least 10 tornadoes touched down in Indiana. One of them, a direct hit on Henryville High. Luckily, the school had evacuated its pupils before disaster struck, but some were still on the way home in a school bus. Surveillance video from inside the bus shows what may have been in store for the students had their bus driver not raced the storm and made it back to the school and under cover three minutes before the twister struck. The empty bus was blown into a building, but no one was harmed. Of course, that isn't the place you want to be. Any vehicle is not good in a tornado. The tornado ran for a remarkable 77 kilometers and lasted almost an hour, hitting not just Henryville, but several other locations in its path. Right after it passed through, an EF-1 was hot on its heels, churning through almost exactly the same track. As if the two tornadoes weren't quite enough, baseball-sized hail also came down the largest ever recorded in Indiana, 12 centimeters in diameter. One of the most tragic stories to emerge from the disaster was the near miracle survival of little Angel Babcock. The toddler was found barely alive in a field after the tornadoes had swept through. Her entire family had been picked up by the vortex and dropped a hundred yards from their home. All were dead, except little Angel, who spent three days in critical condition before being taken off life support. Oh, they loved her. I mean, we all loved all those kids. The severe outbreak that early March also hit Kentucky, Ohio, and Alabama killing more than 40 people. Each year, seasonal outbreaks across the US bring their own set of tragedies. But even forecasters were shocked by how severe April 2011 became. The total number of tornadoes spawned that month 
more than 750, represented nearly a five-fold increase on the norm. Why these outbreaks spawn so many tornadoes is not certain, but recent research suggests it could be part of a disturbing trend. In 2014, a Columbia University study found that the number of tornadoes and extreme outbreaks has jumped dramatically, roughly doubling over the last 50 years. Could this be due to climate change? Do we see a very distinct relationship between tornadic activity and climate change? And the answer is no. If you ask me, has there been any change in recent years about tornado activity? And the answer to that is yes. There seems to be more tornadoes than outbreaks. The number of tornadoes in an outbreak have gotten more extreme, but no one has been able to link that to, to climate change. As the world warms, the oceans are also warming, which adds to the amount of moisture and energy powering storms. Tornadoes are much trickier to deal with. Tornadoes come from superstyle storms. The climate change element is adding a little bit of extra instability. It's making the potential for a superstyle thunderstorm to be a little bit greater. Uh, whether the wind shear occurs or not is a bit of a crapshoot. I don't think that has much to do with climate change one way or the other. But when the tornado outbreaks have occurred, they tend to be a bit bigger and more damaging in recent years. While the Columbia team found no evidence of increasing instability over the US, they did find a substantial increase in storm relative helicity, the potential for rotational storms to occur due to wind conditions. Current models don't suggest this will increase in a warming climate, so the cause remains a mystery. While tornadoes are the main subject of much passionate and focused research, many aspects of their genesis remain unknown. What I find interesting about tornadoes is they're a little difficult to predict, so there's an element of surprise about them, and you don't know sometimes if tornadoes are gonna be really strong or really weak. We actually don't know some of the last processes that really make a storm form a tornado. We've made some major progress in understanding tornado structure. We've made progress in understanding some of the important processes involved with tornado genesis, the birth of tornadoes. So we know what days have enough energy for thunderstorms to form. We know which days we're gonna get waves in the jet stream. What's not so good are the details. And of course, those details are what matter to people living in the paths of the tornadoes. For those that live in the path of tornadoes, there are many questions that need to be answered to adequately know the difference between a bad storm on the horizon and imminent destruction. The details are when exactly are the tornadoes gonna to form? Of those six different supercells, which one or two are gonna make the tornadoes? Of those one or two that are gonna make the tornadoes, when during their one or two hour lifespan and exactly what track will they take? Those are the details we don't know and those are the details that we're really trying to learn. I'm fascinated by tornadoes because they're so unpredictable, they're so powerful, and they really affect at least a part of the population. The questions burning in the minds of tornado researchers, who often risk their lives to answer them, have already saved countless people. In the last half century, the improvements to detection and warning systems mean typically many less people die each season, despite an exploding population. Even to those who live in the bullseye of Tornado Alley, cars, guns, and fire remain a much deadlier daily risk than a tornado. You know, the thing is, the thing why people don't lose too much sleep about it is because the probability of you being hit by this little tiny funnel uh, over this great expanse of territory is, is small. 